everyone. Yes. Thank you for your patience while we were getting sorted. We want to thank you today for joining us for our first EarCodes webinar, Life After E-Learning and a Return to School. Such a big topic, no pressure. Also, we would like to thank Dr. Ed Green, Executive Director of EarCodes, for giving us this opportunity to share with everyone on this webinar. We have insights gained from e-learning, improving for the future, and reopening of the school. Today, we will be joined by Yuck, head of school, Jason Bader, lower school principal, Ms. Julie Sykes, upper school principal, and Frank Vink, our Dean of Technology and Innovation, and myself, Director of Communications at Dwight School Soul. Now we will welcome any questions that you have today, so please put them in the chat box. We will do our best to answer as many of our questions with the time that we have in each section. And without further ado, our head of school will start us off with an introduction. Thank you, Grace. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I don't know if you were listening earlier, but uh, you know, uh, one of the benefits of this uh, new format or the new normal is that we are so well connected with uh, friends and loved ones around the world very easily at touch of a button. So it isn't uh, unusual for ERCOS, the community that normally gets together once a year for a leadership conference, to be here on this site uh, with, I think there's about 70 that have signed up, if not more, uh, to come together just to listen to uh, a topic that's on the minds of all of us. So um, I'm uh, head of school for Dwight School Seoul, and uh, I'll begin. I've got a little bit of a statement sort of to read at the front, and that is uh, to set us into context here. Uh, it should also uh, open up ideas for questions later on, and I'll be joined by my fantastic team who have decided and uh, willingly put together a number of slides and uh, points for a presentation uh, for this morning. So uh, sit back, uh, enjoy, and uh, think, and uh, be certain to include yourselves so that we can recognize you in questions, which Grace will try to uh, attribute to uh, the end of every uh, one of our sections, okay? So uh, countries around the world, remain at very different points in the COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, means they are facing varying challenges, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Uh, we're also on the back of overwhelmed healthcare systems and growing economic despair. So uh, all of this is uh, um, leading into uh, schools and heads of schools and leadership in general and teaching and learning online. So, um, the issue for many of us then is that most primary and secondary schools worldwide have been closed. Some countries like Sweden have, have stayed open while others including China, Denmark, Germany, Japan, Norway recently started opening up their schools and many European and Asian countries have announced plans to reopen in the coming weeks or months. In the United States, 43 states and Washington DC have ordered or recommended keeping in-person schooling closed for the rest of the academic year. And uh, on the minds of uh, many school leaders, we have the risks to public health that are on our, uh, the back of our minds, uh, the importance of the economic situation for our parents and the community and schools as that uh, fits into the context of uh, home life, uh, the impacts to student learning, uh, the completion in our case of the academic year and the uh, matriculation, so to speak, of uh, students moving on to universities and into the next grades, as well as the more important and growing uh, issues, which I don't pretend to know uh, everything about, but uh, child protection and the issues of safeguarding online in this new global format. So, uh, as uh, countries are beginning to emerge in this first wave of COVID-19, uh, the questions of reopening schools is on the front of many of our minds, and just this week, I'd like to mention that uh, for those who uh, think that Seoul is opened, we had news yesterday that our planned opening tomorrow, Wednesday, is now going to be postponed for one week, given a recent spike in cases over the weekend. Uh, this has led from a uh, situation where we've had several start-stop scenarios since February, but I can tell you that the delay was announced yesterday and schools are reacting to that uh, with plans to open the following Wednesday uh, as a result. But how do uh, schools, uh, sorry, so schools provide not just uh, learning uh, and social support systems for students, they also uh, crucially provide childcare. And this is an issue where a lot of school heads and uh, obviously uh, parents are 
unable to go back to regular work or uh, have issues at home based on the fact that their children be at home while they're supposed to be at work. And this is bringing some issues to the ground, petitions being formed, whatever might be expected or happening in your schools. It carries public health risk um, as well by coming back to school. Obviously, uh, heads want to make the right decision that they're not uh, adding to any viral spike in the community. And parents and teachers are understandably anxious on the one hand and wary on the other. So how do schools respond to reopening? Um, E-learning for the most part, I think we can say, has been a very other, relatively easy process here at Dwight. Uh, we're quite fortunate uh, to be in Korea, a technologically advanced uh, country. We're unfortunate to be at Dwight, which is a private school with all the bells and whistles. And I think that uh, anyone who's fortunate to have uh, a modern school with all of the systems in place, with uh, the capabilities that afford to online learning, the turnover from face-to-face -face classroom instruction into online was done very quickly and it was done without much training or practice and it was done well, I would have to say. Uh, the same level of preparedness, however, in some other countries uh, would be uh, seen differently uh, depending on uh, rich or poor. Uh, we've seen uh, through webinars that other countries and uh, other schools around the world have approached this with uh, varying levels of difficulty and that is some of your uh, most advanced uh, countries as well as schools who are not as well set up as they might be in some of your schools. So in order to make it work, and uh, this is also looking at it whether we're running synchronously or asynchronously, uh, it's uh, a certain level of knowledge that is needed within a school framework and motivation <clears throat> on behalf of the staff as well as the community. And I think that uh, that is something where uh, you, the buy-in to online learning, the willingness to do it, and the willingness to facilitate it, and in our case now, the motivation after starting, stop the motivation to keep going after uh, that emotional withdrawal of, uh, of uh, release of uh, going back to face-to-face -to -face turns again uh, when you have to go back into online learning uh, uh, repeatedly over and over. So uh, I am Kevin Skeo. I'm the head of school here in Dwight. And... Uh, with me today is my colleague, Mr. Frank Vink, who is the Dean of Technology Innovation. And Dink, uh, <laughs> Mr. Vink <laughs> is going to share us some uh, examples of what it's been like in terms of the lead up to uh, online learning here at Dwight. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, and once again, welcome to uh, the webinar. Uh, we will start briefly with um, a a short timeline of what we did uh, leading up to our initial closure and what we did uh, to inform all stakeholders uh, of the closure. Because in our opinion, um, keeping stakeholders involved and communicating efficiently with stakeholders is going to be uh, essential to any situation that we're currently experiencing. So, um, we were fortunate to have a little lead up into our um, closure before we actually had to close. So about four weeks before we had to close, we started researching how we would go about if uh, we would have to close. Um, we decided to stay uh, a Google school. We are a Google school and we decided to initially open up with um, uh, online learning using the Google platform because this is what students and the community is familiar with. Um, straight away, we um, communicated with the uh, parent community on our website and in um, email notifications that uh, what our plans were and who to contact in uh, case of questions or issues. Um, then we started teaching our staff how to use Google Meets um, before the closure still. Then the day before we actually had to close by the Korean government, we had the students still in school and we had sessions with all of the classes, all of the students from grade four and up on how to use Google Meets as well. And I think this was um, a big contributor in uh, the initial success. Um, students became familiar with uh, the platforms that we were using and any issues could be ironed out while they were still in school. Um, the only other thing we needed to do was switch uh, our other platform for lower grades, Seesaw, from uh, class login into um, individual login. And that basically prepared us for um, the closure initially. So the initial implementation is what Julie and Jason will briefly go into. 
And before we go into that, I would just like to take a moment to introduce Trillium Hebel. Trillium, are you on the call? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. She is Associate Director for the Commission on International Education at the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. And could you just please share with us what you're seeing as far as closures and online learning? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, Kevin asked me to join um, to add just a little bit additional dimension to the conversation because um, at NIASC we were representing schools in 80 countries and uh, many in the Air Coast region. And so we, we have the bird's eye view over the various um, implementations of um, emergency distance learning and also of um, reopening. And um, not, not as a plug, but just as a mention that um, we have a webinar going on about 12 hours from now, um, which features Kevin as one of our speakers, but also um, people from Denmark and Germany who are a few weeks ahead on the opening that will share some of their um, ideas as well. And um, I won't, I know um, the really important conversation that you want to have about exactly what's happened at Dwight is um, the focus of this webinar. Mm -hmm. But if, 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 if you'd like, you know, I can jump in here and there and add some comments about what, how that relates to what we're seeing in other schools around the region and around the world. Um, and I will just say that, you know, this is such a unique time for everyone, as we all know, that there's really no such thing as best practice around these things anymore. There's just a representative practice. And that's why a webinar like this is so important because hearing what one school does can, can really help other schools to figure out what they might do or, or to say to themselves, oh, I hadn't thought of that yet. So I just applaud Aircoast for hosting these webinars and I'm happy to answer any questions that may come up. Great, thank, thank you so you. much. And now we're going to move to Jason Hader and Julie Sykes for changes to the curriculum. Hey, thank you, Grace, and good morning, everyone, once again. Uh, we know the, the primary focus is to talk about what things look like when you do reopen a school and some of the strategies and implementation of, of procedures that you put in place when we do reopen. But we just thought we'd take a very, very brief moment just to give you a bit of background of where, we're, where our e-learning was and um, how we started and how we moved to the point where we're getting uh, ready to reopen, just so you have that kind of background of uh, the implementation and the, the impact that it has on our programming and our students when they do return. So we'll be very brief uh, because we know many of you are probably like us now and feel like you're experts in, in e-learning and, um, and ready to move on and get back to face-to-face. -to -face. But as Frank mentioned, we're fortunate we are a one-to-one -one school from grade four and up. So in lower school, which is ECD, preschool students are age three to grade five, we ran two different types of e-learning programs. Uh, we had one-to-one -one, uh, laptops in grade four and five, and so the program there was ran through Google Meets, as Frank mentioned. Uh, when we began, we thought we weren't sure how long this was going to last, so we thought we would just leave the timetable as is, and all programming, all instruction was uh, for grade four and five students was through Google Meets. Um, they, had their reg they followed their regular timetable. If they went off to phys ed, the phys ed teacher joined them on the Google Meet and uh, led their lesson that way. If they went off to drama, or music or languages, the same thing. And with all of their homeroom lessons, they had their homeroom teachers. So it was basically a regular school day through Google Meet. For our younger students, ECD to grade three, as Frank mentioned, we used the platform Seesaw. And that was an asynchronous approach to learning where uh, teachers would post morning messages and they would post all their tasks for all subject areas first thing in the morning. And then students had time throughout the day to work on their tasks and resubmit them back to the teacher where they would get feedback. Uh, we'll talk about some of the changes that we made to that as we went through the e-learning and how it impacts our return to school a little bit later on. But right now I'll transition over to, to Julie Sykes, our upper school principal, and she can give you the initial layout for upper school. Thank you. So with upper school, so in upper school that's grade six to 12 and we run MYP and DP. So with those, we decided to again, like grade four and five, teach keep the curriculum as consistent as possible. We were initially briefing the teachers for a two to four week closure. So we kept all the lessons the same. The students logged in to Google Classroom when they had a class and then used that along, sorry, Google Hangout, and used that along with Google Classroom and ManageBack for their tasks and for working together. 
So there was absolutely no changes that we made to the normal school day for any child in upper school initially. Right, and I think that's it, great. Okay. So adding to that, from, um, from a technical perspective, uh, the initial transition to, um, to online learning was actually pretty smooth. Once again, our students and our uh, families, they have enough devices, but even we supplied uh, devices, uh, for instance, uh, iPads to lower school parents who did not have, who, who had more children than devices in the house. Um, but the transition initially was uh, pretty smooth. There were some sign-in issues, mostly with uh, Seesaw. Um, the uh, community guidelines on the website, as I mentioned, were updated straight away as, as soon as we had new information on where we were going and how long this was going to take. We updated the community uh, information on our website. Technical issues were mostly solved actually by updating Chrome and uh, operating systems uh, for students and faculty because faculty needed to adjust to this as well, of course, by um, nobody learned how to do this. We had to learn by doing and while doing it. So that led to some insecurity in, uh, in faculty um, who we had to support. And we were once again fortunate to be allowed into the school building so we could work together with insecure faculty who had difficulty creating tutorials or leading lessons online so we could um, support them both in a technical field and in a pedagogical field. Um, as I mentioned, despite suggestions to use other platforms, we decided to stay with what we had and what our community knows, because in our opinion, it's better to use a platform that is maybe not perfect, but is something that the community is familiar with. This is not the time to improvise in that respect. There is too much insecurity already. Um, and keeping uh, the platform consistent was, um, was uh, once again enabling a smooth transition. The massive impact though was um, the adaptation we did to the, uh, to the timetable after the initial two weeks of online learning, which is where Julie and Jason will add some info. Uh, yeah, thanks Frank. As Frank mentioned earlier, uh, we felt it was very important to, to continue that communication and even enhance that communication with all stakeholders involved. Uh, as teachers, we, knew good, we know good teaching practice is to reflect on our lessons, to reflect on our program and reflect on the learning of the students. This was something that was new and challenging when in the e-learning or the online learning world. But as the uh, amount of weeks of online learning ticked by, we had to um, look for ways to, to reflect. And this was done in a variety of ways, which uh, Grace will share a little bit later on in our communication with parents. But that led to us changing the program in order to best meet the needs of, of the students and, and uh, the feedback that we received. It was about finding that balance. Uh, our grade four and five one-to-one -one program was working really well. And our teachers only wanted to make some small minor changes. And that was, a, I'm sure many of you would agree, uh, from doing this for a number of weeks was reduce that amount of time kids are on screen and sitting and looking at a computer. Uh, we changed uh, one or two periods a day where they were off screen tasks or off screen periods and students were supposed to power down, shut down their computer and go do something physical, go do something outside or work on the task with pen and paper or just read a good old fashioned book in their hand. Um, on the flip side, uh, our younger students were missing that social connection, that connection with their teacher, uh, that connection with their classmates and friends. So we added um, some screen time in the, in the form of a Google Hangout where they had at least three Google Hangouts a day. Some teachers did it every day. Some teachers did it uh, a couple of times a day where the kids could check in and have a story read, uh, read to them by their teacher. Uh, they could uh, communicate with their classmates and, and uh, talk to their friends. Additionally, we also shift the, the focus, a bit of a focus of our programming to mainly on literacy and numeracy. A lot of the tasks, we wanted to reduce the number of tasks and make sure that they are stronger and more rich. Uh, so it was less uh, quantity and more quality. Um, it was also tough, this part was tough too, uh, for teachers just to take that moment to realize that 
we can slow down the pace. We, the, the pace of learning is going to be very different online. Uh, we don't know uh, how much support students are getting at home from parents. Uh, we don't know how much access they have to technology. So having to adjust and slow down the pace um, and, uh, and the focus of our learning priorities were the main changes that, that we made. So it's the addition of Google Hangouts to Seesaw in the lower grades and that reduction of uh, the screen time for the upper grade, uh, four and five. And for the most part, um, that's where we stuck with our program from, from there on in. And with upper school, we did three main changes, I think, with our curriculum. So the first thing we looked at is the introduction of drop-ins as lessons. We discovered that our students and our teachers were going a little bit crazy with the amount of time sat still every day on a computer. So we took a normal school timetable, I think the one up there looks like grade 11 um, timetable there, and we color coded each of the lessons. So 50, approximately 50% 50 of the lessons were designated as taught lessons, which are compulsory for the students to be in school, to be on the hangout for. And approximately 50% of those were classed as drop-ins or tutorials, where the students could choose to come in to get some one-on-one um, -on -one help with, the, with their teachers, or a teacher could request one or more students to come on during that time to get some small group help. So this allowed the students to actually plan their work for the day. It also gave us a really good opportunity to actually help their organizational skills. As you see with this screen, all of those subjects are linked. So they all link directly to a hangout for that class. So it means the students have just one place to actually go so they know how to access their class. And that also helped the admin of the school because we could actually have very quick access to the Hangouts and drop by some lessons and say hello and see what's going on. Although I must say I did drop in on an oral exam. So I was a little bit more careful after that initial mistake. Um, also linked on there is the weekly objectives. So this means a student who is perhaps more independent could just look at the weekly objectives and look at the tasks that were required that week and can run ahead and start working on things in the evenings, earlier in the morning, whenever they wish, if they wanted to. But it also gave the security for um, the less organized or strong students to actually go back to that to make sure they are doing what is required. We thought this actually helped the students be able to take a break during the day. And in some cases, the teachers to stretch their legs as well. One thing we didn't anticipate is that many of our teachers went and changed what they were teaching to make it a more theoretical unit they were doing. So for example, PHE moved from fitness to a health unit. Music changed from doing something with group um, instruments playing together to a theoretical unit. So everyone had moved initially to a theoretical sort of unit, which meant the students were not moving and they were just getting too tired. So another thing the teachers did is actually accepting that this was um, the normal for the foreseeable future and looking how they can actually use the online system to actually help and enhance their teaching, not as the stopgap. So for instance, PHE moved back to fitness and they all had to be dressed in their P uniform, ready with their cameras placed for a group fitness lesson. Music moved to a rhythm unit. So everyone had to get the pans and the chopsticks out and they all work together on that sort of thing. We had many um, classes that perhaps weren't so practical. They actually started using um, things that are normally found in the home. For example, dress up as the character before you start reading and discussing the novel in English to actually get students more into active things and more into actually using what they have around them. 
Then another thing we looked at is, I've forgotten because I kept going, is, <laughs> sorry, is um, initially, because we're an NYP school and a DP school, we do, we do usually have lots of open-ended and extended tasks. And I think initially our teachers actually dropped that idea when we first went on to online learning and went into a more traditional lecture style of teaching. And I think that was just as a comfort zone, I think, of move changing so much. And it worked okay for a little while, but it isn't a long-term solution. So the teachers actually all gradually, we didn't instruct them initially, but they did actually just naturally move back to their normal extended tasks, small group exercises, which was really nice. So now they didn't need that comfort of almost a chalk and talk, but with a computer screen. They could have the confidence of letting students go into multiple hangouts with a teacher dropping into the hangouts, seeing how they're doing. And it made teaching go more naturally. And I think everyone just felt a lot happier, both the students and the teachers, that they were learning in a way that they were more used to. Obviously, we have a few other things that we need to look at, as well as the curriculum. For example, we have student support which I think Jason is going to go through how we change this. Yeah, and uh, I just want to reiterate the, the reflection of these and the changes. Um, we're sharing this because when we talk about the impact of reopening, you know, um, these changes have impacted how our school reopens and how it impacts the, the curriculum, the program as our students return, uh, hopefully uh, next week. Uh, but as Quest is uh, our learning support program here at, at Dwight, and um, at first, we, we tried the same thing. We attempted to maintain the, a similar schedule for those students, but it became uh, very quickly aware to us that our, some of these students were having difficulty accessing the curriculum and accessing the program. Some of them um, have challenges um, in what we call the regular school day. So those challenges were uh, highlighted and, and uh, even more accentuated of the online learning. So, we have a number of learning support teachers that work with a number of different students across a variety of grades and with the low in the lower school with some of the grades work asynchronously and the other grades maintain their timetable it became a bit of a clash uh, for support for these teachers um, as students multiple students were needing them at the same time so we just revised their whole uh, timetable for the teachers and assigned specific grades to our learning support teachers uh, for the lower kids with seesaw they were to work and collaborate with the classroom teacher to differentiate the, the tasks that were being posted on Seesaw and give a, uh, some additional accommodated tasks. While in grade four and five, these learning support teachers uh, did kind of like a combination of a push and pull in, uh, push in, pull out, sorry, as they would sit into the Google Hangout with the teacher and the class for the lesson and then they would pull a little group out to the side of our learning support students and work with them uh, individually and support their needs. Uh, this uh, in the upper school, they were able to maintain their timetable more because they're more of a rotary based timetable. So uh, we just designated some learning support teachers to the students in upper school that required that support and they could drop in and get support with tasks or assignments um, and get feedback from the, the our, our quest teachers. Um, it also worked well because it allowed these teachers to form closer relationships with these individual students, really get to know their learning style, really have some focused um, instruction and, and time to work with these students. And a lot of our actually, a lot of our learning support students really thrived with the, end up really thriving on the e-learning and uh, making significant gains. And it was nice to be able to communicate that with the parents as our Quest teachers report weekly to them and uh, were able to share that feedback. So those changes uh, were very critical to the success of those students and will have an impact when we return back to school. And also with this, um, there's just two quick questions. Um, there's a question from C. Bennett. How are teachers who have young children managing when they are required to be available most of the day? So with our, uh, with our teachers, with um, our staff members who had children, we were able to have, we had a, a couple of babysitters came into our school and they, were, they looked after those uh, children. So they brought their children into school. There's a designated room in our building for those, uh, for those students. And these babysitters would support those students uh, with online learning. Fortunately, 
Uh, we also have some uh, staff members with really young children. In some cases, daycares here in Seoul remained open for emergency purposes. And uh, if they, we had dual staff members, depending on what type of program they were delivering, if it was online um, synchronously or um, asynchronous, um, they would work from home and they would uh, manage a way to be able to care for their child while also delivering their program. I think, Jason, it's important to note here that uh, uh, Korea, unlike other countries, uh, um, the, the staff were largely uh, stayed in Seoul and it was mandated. I've uh, mentioned this later on that uh, uh, one of the luxuries that was afforded is that we kept staff here. Uh, they're living within 500 meters of the school, but they did not leave to go to their home country. They didn't do distance learning or uh, asynchronous uh, online education. They were all within uh, uh, arm's length, so to speak, of the, uh, of the community and the school itself. So that, that kept us tight and it also kept us uh, in a known environment and also at the ready for any changes that happened later. Uh, the, also, there wasn't a social lockdown like there is uh, seen right now in other countries. Uh, there was a fluidity of uh, staff allowing to come in and out with a, uh, a bar on those who could uh, actually enter the gate being visitors and, uh, and guests. Uh, so that was managed. So we do have um, legitimate issues with regards to staff children, uh, but uh, uh, provisions provided within the school in a contained area for them with their ability to do online uh, learning according to their classes uh, uh, taking place daily. Yeah. And then we have a second question. Um, how did secondary students handle the mandatory live sessions for much of the day? What if they didn't attend these mandatory sessions? Um, how did we handle that? Okay, so what I'll do is I'll continue with a little bit on student support because that will lead into this and hopefully answer that in this next little section. So along with our quest, which is our learning support, we discovered we needed to put in a bit more student support when we changed the timetable. And we looked at different ways of doing that. Now, the first way we looked at is with broadcast. So every, twice a week, usually, we have a five minute um, video broadcast, which has the student announces on, announcements on. This became really important when we went to online. This um, started every day with a student who is a very good film student um, filming from home with the help of some teachers online. And this tried to keep all of our community um, connected. So we would have announcements of achievements. We would have um, competitions. So for example, week number one, we had the pet selfie competition where you had to take a selfie with your pet. And, the, and we looked at who got the winning prize. In the weeks after, we did things like um, dance competitions where you had to film yourself. We also had advisory hangouts. So for instance, um, for instance, um, at the end of the school day, every Friday, I think it was, we had each of the student reps setting up a hangout where the students can just go to chat without <coughs> adult supervision in the way. We initially, um, our teacher who's in charge of advisory did start dropping by to see what was going on, but she had the wonderful effect of stopping all conversation instantly when she turned up. So we decided after that to just leave it to the class reps and the class reps then reported to that teacher um, via email on how things were going. We also had things like students would set up a movie club where they all watched the same movie on Netflix during the week and then went into a hangout at a certain point to discuss the movie. So there's lots of wonderful things there. But one of the other things we had to look at is the counselling. So we do have a school counsellor in the school and those counselling sessions had to continue. We have a number of students who are in regular um, weekly counselling sessions with him and those continued online. And we also had to put on place a mechanism for teachers to highlight students who were not coping very well. And this went either to the counsellor if it was uh, more of an emotional issue or the curriculum coordinators, if it's a more of the not doing work and perhaps might have been a student who had some troubles anywhere with day-to-day school work, 
and that's actually got worse since they're not being put on a school bus forcing them into school but we're actually quite lucky in the upper school of 300 about 350 students on the first two weeks of school we actually had a hundred percent attendance every single day online since then it's dropped down a little bit we've had a number of students who've had to relocate overseas so they have now got permission to go asynchronous instead of synchronous and that means they've had to follow um, the classroom in Google Classroom. Um, that's actually not been too difficult because Hangouts will allow you to record the Hangout and then put the Hangout in Google Classroom so they can continue. And then after that, I think we've got seven students in upper school who are need a little bit more chasing. Um, these are students that we've known about even before e-learning would have needed a little bit more chasing up. So it isn't something just due to e-learning and that has involved um, having meetings with parents online and looking at how we can adapt their timetable and their tasks in some cases when they are having um, struggling with being locked down in a house or a small apartment for yeah. weeks on end. We, we actually have the advantage uh, of uh, a community that's very tight and uh, um, uh, known to one another. But if the question weren't, you know, uh, if a teacher doesn't show up to a Google uh, meet or attend a lesson, uh, how is that dealt with? And in large part, you know, most schools are unprepared to deal with this. We can deal with the day to day operations and we've basically tried to put into place uh, the policies that we ran day to day with the policies that we put in uh, for online. Um, if a teacher was sick or uh, couldn't attend online lessons, then there would be a cover situation that would be built in or there'd be a maneuvering that would take place by the principals in the, in the timetable of some sort uh, along those lines. But uh, largely mandated, uh, your uh, a student attendance became an actual uh, indicator of guaranteed hours in instruction that uh, we used for um, matriculation standards and credit base for graduating. So that, uh, I think, has brought to a head the, uh, the issue for any parents who whose children were not able to uh, attend classes and uh, therefore were uh, brought into that uh, realm very quickly. I think that answers the question, Grace, is that correct? Yeah. yeah, and we actually found that students loved to come online with their teachers, even when it wasn't mandatory in the Hangouts, lots of students would come online just to say hello to their teacher. And we think that this is basically due to the fact they are at home with no siblings and potentially both parents working. So they were missing that social contact. And lots of teachers have actually reported on how more developed their relationships are with the students due to this process. Okay. So it's actually come out quite positive. Good. Uh, we have a quick question from Marcy. And um, I think Frank, you can answer this. Which platform do we use for broadcasting morning announcements? Okay, that is simply uh, YouTube. Uh, channel. We have a dedicated YouTube channel for morning broadcast. We have several dedicated um, channels. We do some uh, some live streaming of events in the auditorium, um, but these ones are pre-recorded and they are shared in a uh, in a YouTube uh, channel. What uh, provisions did we put in place earlier to go live with that? There was a there was a big change this year before uh, the onset of the pandemic that allowed us to uh, live stream uh, broadcasts and school events. Uh, Frank, do you want? Can I comment a bit further on that? Uh, yeah, the main reason for for wanting to do live streams was uh, growing as a school, growing as a community, and uh, ultimately not fitting in the auditorium anymore. So um, we we had to get the provision to get a live video mixer uh, in the auditorium um, to allow us to stream. Is that a is that a device you buy uh, locally? Where do you get this live mixer from, and how does it work in a school? That's a good question. Justin will answer. That. <laughs> Justin, but, uh, but the basic reason I'm asking is that it was, a, it was an innovative change this year yes. that uh, caused a real. Actually, it happened towards the end of last year, but it's made events uh, of late very. Uh, um, I think easy to uh, to organize around. For example, graduation at the end of this year is live streamed. Uh, doesn't mean uh, as a significant uh, portion of guests and families that will be traveling abroad will be missing out. Uh, it yeah. can be actually run quite normally from the context of the school, but can be broadcast out around the world. And we can actually focus that into our select community members on YouTube. Is that correct? 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. We either open the link up to uh, everyone to see, or only um, yeah. only to those who have the link. It is something that you purchase. It is something around four thousand dollars, but I'm not sure uh, exactly how and what it works. But I'm sure if you ask uh, Justin, our it's man, it's beautiful. Uh, Grace. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and then we created a quick poll. It's completely anonymous. And um, if you're in your browser, you might not be able to access it, um, but we can get the results of the poll right away. So um, we have countries all across Asia and other countries as well outside of Asia participating. So I think it would be interesting just to gather a little bit of information for everyone who's on this call today. Um, Frank will load the poll now. And this is just one of two polls, just a few quick questions. So we'll just give you a few seconds for that before we continue on. Okay. okay. So now we're moving on to how is e-learning going? How did we gauge um, how everyone is doing? There's different groups when considering e-learning. Um, and we did that through surveys. Surveys went up periodically in a rotation and usually with a newsletter. And it went out to um, staff. There's a staff survey, student survey, and as well as a parent survey. And so each of those surveys had different questions catered to that group. Um, and with the answers that we received, we were able to gather very important data. Um, you can see some of our sample questions and our survey results. Um, how would you best describe your child's ability to complete the tasks that during e-learning? So we had different options and we can see what percentage of children were engaged, um, were doing well with the platform, understood the platform, and similarly with parents. We could also identify areas of struggle and opportunities and we use these um, to make updates to our program. And additionally, we added wellness check questions um, and then there was a part at the bottom of every single survey where people could just write uh, whatever comment or question that they had and we can see individual um, comments with that tied um, email account. And with this, we found opportunities to boost morale and engage. We recognized a huge need to keep our community virtually connected and we did this through, as Julie mentioned, challenges, contests, collaborative projects. We created dance and song video collages. We had tips for e-learning. It was a slideshow video. And we also had teacher-student song collaborations. Um, we just asked for submissions. And then we took those separate individual submissions and turned them into collages and uploaded them either on YouTube or onto Facebook and shared them with our community. Um, we also have a weekly newsletter that goes out too, actually. One is a Friday flashback um, with things that happen throughout the week. There's pictures and videos uploaded onto that, and that's sent out to parents, and students can request to be on that email list as well. And we have a Sunday newsletter, Peak of the Week, which gives you a peek of the upcoming events and things to look out for, projects and trips. And then last but not least, we had questions about our platform. Um, the access to it, understanding of it, and usability of it. Um, is it too much or too little of it? And then we communicated these results to our senior leadership team, which then shared the summary and the data and specific comments. And with the graded, uh, the love, level of engagement, we were able to make all of those adjustments for improvements. And now we are going to pause for any other questions that we have currently. Let's see. Okay. We have a few questions that came in. Charlotte Diller, um, can you put the item names um, that she's interested in learning about the reopening plans, facility schedules, social distancing, et cetera? Uh, we are going to be covering that in just a moment, so we'll be moving on to that um, in just a few moments. Okay. And we have a comment from David Chadwell. Here in Vietnam, we are in our seventh day of reopening, starting with grade 9 and 12, then 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, and 11. Lucky you, David. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then yesterday, added 1 through 3, attendance has been about 90%. That's fantastic. 
Um, and then there's lots of social distancing and regulations from the government. Okay, so hopefully um, you can share with us when we move on to what we're doing to um, the reentry of school. Yeah. So now we're moving on to improvements for the future with Kevin. Um, thanks, Grace. Uh, we're fully aware of the uh, title and the context and the uh, two hours of webinar. Where the context is uh, often answered by uh, what you're doing. Look, the full, uh, full intention here is to have been opening uh, for tomorrow. In fact, uh, it's not that we haven't opened, we've opened four times. Um, and we've, <laughs> we've communicated to our parents in, uh, multiple times. Each letter gets more and more detailed and more and more thorough. And I'm sure that uh, the participants online can add, add to, uh, uh, to what we're saying in terms of comments as well. And uh, we welcome that. Um, and definitely uh, improvements for the future, and this is the, uh, the understanding that we are uh, developing always in the approach to, to opening, is that this benefit is, uh, by teleconferencing, has by far been the best thing that's happened uh, for me as a head, but also in recognizing across the school. I think when online learning uh, became inevitable, I said to the staff at the start, you know, this is going to be the best professional development that you have no choice in doing. And uh, young or old, and I don't mean anything negative on either side of that, uh, every teacher now, whether a different uh, spectrum of uh, online learning and education and technology, has grown, and they've done a tremendous job, and I think that's the same in your own schools. However, it may not be. Um, you know, I happen to have family in uh, the UK. I, we've been speaking to uh, various schools in the United States and, uh, and across the world. Uh, teachers are approaching this with different attitudes and different opinions and different skills of, skill abilities. And, you know, sometimes, uh, whether uh, positive or negative, the, the, a union might get involved and uh, just stop the process altogether. And uh, I think that the private school sector and the, uh, the uh, uptake of technology in an emergency situation, which this has been, has been, has been uh, wonderful for the individual professional development that I've seen. But uh, the conferencing is the main thing. Um, Networking and these sorts of uh, meetings are now much more accessible. They're much more uh, 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 time uh, worthy. And uh, both, uh, uh, some of you might have networks that you're associated with. Those meetings now are actually more and better organized around the world and they're done more often, as I said. Um, speaking of uh, the situation here in Korea, uh, prior to online uh, learning, I think that the heads of school and Steve Cathers, who's, uh, is, who's with us today uh, in Fiji, uh, is a prior member of the Kayak group. Uh, I can tell you that Kayak has really come together as a group of heads, uh, not just to support Kayak sporting events and athletics, but now as an actual school association. And the meeting uh, provided by online is now a weekly thing. And we've used that for the development now of four consistent efforts to get schools running here in Korea to where at least in the last uh, 24 hours, uh, the association has been used as a little bit of a lobby to the government to say, hold on a minute here, and this is what we're going to get to, is that your provisions for starting a school, which were associated with, let's, uh, with the Korean uh, public schools, have a very little or different uh, context to uh, international and foreign schools who are coming to an end of their curriculum. So that unity uh, has been helpful, and it's only due to COVID that uh, we've seen that come to head. Uh, the communication with parents has actually been uh, seen to be more regular. This is a school that uh, go out uh, every week, as Grace has said, with regular communication, but uh, any updates are worthy and parents just want to be heard. Uh, we tend to forget that uh, parents and uh, in Korea, and I think it's the same in uh, other parts, people are sitting in isolation in their homes and uh, any form of context or communication is, is valued, even if there's nothing to say. Um, I think also it should be noted that in hindsight, the decision to keep staff in Korea and in Seoul was a good decision. That was a very difficult decision to make. Uh, there were three big schools here that uh, actually, I think, uh, unifiedly uh, put that decision forward to make uh, it known that they didn't want staff leaving so that they could lose control of the, uh, the online environment. Um, whether you see it on both sides or not, uh, I think that in our case, it was a valuable decision to keep people uh, in, in, uh, in the community, uh, our teachers, that is. Uh, we also saw that there's a real increase in anxiety across uh, different parts of the school, especially with teachers at different uh, uh, weekly periods uh, through online learning. We're in our ninth week, I believe now, but definitely uh, week two, week five, and week eight had significant changes to attitudes. And that wasn't uh, helped when you had these start-stop situations going forward. And that had different uh, uh, outcomes for management to deal with. 
Students on the whole were very uh, welcoming to online. They took part, as Julie said, 100% attendance. We haven't had any discipline issues or major discipline issues, and the ones that we have had, we've uh, managed to deal with. But uh, I'll finally add here in terms of uh, improvements for the future is that the budgets uh, for schools and the provisions for emergency budgeting have made uh, me more aware, at least, that uh, the onset of online education has not been a cheaper uh, or a less expensive uh, venture. You know, uh, we, be, we happen to be here in Korea. Expectation is already very high. So to maintain that and to go further uh, means keeping up with the, uh, the best of the best. And that is, uh, that is something, as you know, with technology uh, that doesn't come cheaply. So we've seen that there's been a real spike in, uh, in, in, in costs associated with not only getting ready for the, pen, uh, for the reopening, but also the actual uh, technology associated with online education. So um, I'm going to hand over to you now, Grace, and we're going to jump right into the, um, uh, the decisions for the reopening and the government here in Korea and the, uh, the starting, okay? Okay. So um, just to, to tie that all up, um, in communications, my biggest lessons was to, um, in going through this, is just to consistently and often um, communicate with uh, families through letters or our website. If you can put a pop up up there, that's very helpful. If they did not receive the email or there's something going on um, and they're not receiving the letter, then it's good to have a website pop up. Um, and then in all these letters and surveys and data and procedures that we put out, we just created a database so that we have that to go back to um, for the future. And because of this, we created a lot more online video content. So, um, and this was to communicate with our community, not only our students, but also our parents. And these included videos about um, procedures and instructions, just for engagement and morale. So this is a new normal. And I think communications will continue to produce more online content. Um, we found a lot of engagement with this and um, we have had very good reactions. And then to share resources with parents, um, I think that it's uh, weekly, we've been sending out newsletters with online resources, free websites, activities. I think Scholastic has something out there right now. Audible.com has something out there right now. And um, art galleries all over the world. And um, as these resources are popping up, we're just putting them in our newsletter for families. Um, because we know that everyone's at home, they're looking for something um, educational, if we can have it, something fun, entertaining for the family. And um, this includes newspapers and educational magazines as well. So the, uh, uh, I think the opportunity, I have some questions here uh, on the uh, actual reopening here uh, in Korea or anyone else uh, would be uh, coming ahead to uh, talk about the requirements here in Korea that we've had to meet. I ended by saying the fiscal responsibilities, uh, not only of restarting, but also uh, to go one uh, step above and beyond uh, the best of the best, so to speak. Uh, um, so the Korean government uh, is run in terms of education by two major authorities. Obviously, there's the Ministry of Education, and then when Seoul, uh, the province of, province of Seoul, I think it's the province, uh, has the Seoul Metropolitan Office of Education. Both uh, should work part and part, but at times they may disagree. And uh, in the case of this week, we have a disagreement where the Seoul government has rejected what the ministry has uh, stipulated for reopening uh, tomorrow. Uh, in order to avoid a conflict uh, and the uh, challenge the ministry would fight against Seoul, the uh, ministry backed last night the decision to uh, postpone for one week the reopening of schools here. That is due to a crisis in terms of a, a spike in the pandemic that, uh, a spike in the cases, sorry, uh, that happened uh, uh, over the weekend. Uh, and you can read about that in the press. Uh, Korea, for uh, most of us, has been seen as a model example for how to uh, contain a country with a, uh, a, a communicable disease such as this, uh, and now is bracing for the impact of a resurgence. So I think that that will be on the minds of many uh, who are opening now. And this is uh, certainly in the press this morning going around as a topic, uh, how to deal with uh, resurgence in the case of opening schools and opening up businesses as we uh, move into the next phase. So we have had a book upon book of uh, uh, responses to opening, some of which have been rather difficult to manage, but I think in uh, terms of this school and others here in Korea, we've managed to do it uh, quite easily. Uh, 
Now, if I talk through, please feel free to candidly add in, but uh, you'll see in front of you here is this uh, thermal imaging camera. Uh, these things are not uh, inexpensive. Uh, we have two of them, uh, and we reduced all entry points in the school to two areas. So all students, staff, and guests, if they were invited, and that's important to note, uh, no guests were to, are coming into the school anymore. It's just staff and uh, students. And they would have to enter through one of, uh, sorry, two entry points uh, reduced down from five across the school. These would be uh, 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 manned uh, stations in the mornings and uh, a uh, security level uh, controlled in uh, off hours uh, to ensure that anyone uh, approaching or entering the school would be going through and uh, a buzzer would alarm if the temperature read over 37.5 and it would be dealt with with regards to uh, that person being isolated and putting into an isolation room, which I'll talk about is another requirement that we have to fulfill here in Korea. But before you get to the thermal camera, you have to pass through the front gate. And at the front gate, you have to have your temperature taken with a digital thermometer. Uh, the, that digital thermometer is also in all classrooms. And it's uh, mandated by the government that all classrooms have to have this uh, survival kit uh, placed into it. Uh, it's a viral survival kit of which uh, Frank is showing an example of the contents of that. Um, now, this uh, it was to meet an immediate need in the case of a, a reaction of a student who's becoming unwell, uh, that this class teacher, I assume, has the uh, tools at the ready in the classroom uh, before the nurse can take over and the isolation room can, uh, can be the uh, area of triage. In that case, you've got your uh, sanitizer uh, napkins, you've got your sanitizer, you've got your masks, you've got the digital um, thermometer, and uh, it's all put together in a school uh, housed box that uh, was uh, largely put together by uh, our business support staff uh, and uh, meeting that requirement. The isolation room. Uh, now this is a, a room that is designated and uh, put in the school that will be for hard cases when they don't meet the 37.5. What do you do with them if they've been dropped off in the morning? What do you do with them if they have a suspected case in the school? Uh, there's a room that is often uh, not connected to the school that uh, is safe and uh, can be controlled before uh, parents or paramedics can come to look after that particular child. I think in the case of Korea here, we had to meet three uh, scenarios for protocols, what to do if a case of COVID exists, if it comes uh, available in the school, and what to do you know, in case of teachers or parents and all of that. And we had to respond accordingly in print, but also in practice. The uh, markings here with uh, our, a couple of our lower school teachers are uh, social distancing in our cafeteria. Uh, it's a little bit strange to think that we have to know what uh, uh, two meters apart is like, but uh, uh, it's funny, or one and a half meter, I don't know what it is, but the, uh, the markings here would be to avoid as much social contact as possible. And we had this discussion early on in our senior leadership, when you bring in young people, the common uh, after, it's almost like restarting school again. Uh, it's, at least that's what it feels. And the reaction would be you naturally want to say hello to your friends and, uh, and talk and maybe greet. But the whole socialization has now changed. Uh, no touching, there would be uh, no handshaking, no hugging. Obviously, uh, there would be an acknowledgement, but it's the distancing. And I'll get to the masks in a minute. But here you have an example of during the biggest um, Challenge areas would be the cafeteria and any uh, group spaces across the school where people would be uh, expected to be in closer distances. And we had to manage that through different uh, rotas as well as offering students the ability, especially in the upper grades, to eat in different locations. The other interesting thing is that we had, uh, uh, with the benefit of many of our film productive crew and uh, staff, the benefit of putting together uh, short video clips. And this is uh, on our re-entry uh, prior to re-entry to inform parents and students of exactly the procedures that would be expected when you enter the school. Uh, done with a little bit of tongue-in-cheek and a little bit of humor, but it's also very effective because it's, uh, uh, it's uh, known to the students and it was also done with a very, uh, I think, uh, purpose, uh, purpose in mind and uh, uh, it went down very well. The uh, purchase of the antiviral film uh, for all elevator buttons, all door handles and office uh, spaces that are often human uh, uh, high traffic areas is a Korean thing. I haven't seen it in most places, but it's certainly been in all the 
elevators and uh, certainly been in offices that I've passed through, coffee shops, this sort of thing. It's a film that goes over the buttons and prevents the virus from spreading. I don't have the chemistry on that, but uh, uh, it, is, it has been purchased and installed across the school to add that one layer of uh, extra protection. The dividers in the, in the cafeteria are also something that we've added. And these are plastic dividers that are about a meter high that basically <laughs> separate uh, your, uh, uh, call, uh, so your peer from uh, uh, one side of the uh, table to the other and that uh, any uh, moisture going between <laughs> the two sides would be avoided with a plastic screen in between. I don't know how else to describe it, but at, uh, at, at, at moments uh, notice these were purchased for the entire cafeteria and uh, sitting on all desks. And they were purchased on the understanding that over the past eight years in my history here, I've seen this crisis develop into where it is now. And you know, if it was SARS or MERS and now it's COVID, it's roughly every two or three, four years that we've seen a crisis. These purchases are not going to be uh, simply left uh, uh, for the, the short term. I am assuming that they'll be used over and over and uh, sadly uh, used over and over in the future. Um, I think, have I missed anything? Uh, masks, but masks but of course. Masks has been the biggest issue in the world and whether to wear or not to wear. I can say that on the Ministry of Education side, it is now a mandatory aspect for, uh, for uh, social engagement outside, of, uh, uh, in, outside in Korea. Most Koreans are wearing masks. Most uh, are re regulated to wear a mask. The wearing of a mask uh, is actually uh, passed out by the, sorry, masks are passed out to students when they enter, uh, as well as teachers here in the school. And uh, internally, uh, you will see Koreans not uh, wearing the mask internally so much, but they will be certainly wearing them as they go out and about, especially if they're in a, uh, a very um, crowded space, okay? so. Um, I thank all of you also, thank you, Julie. Uh, anyone who's entering the school now, this is very controversial. I think less so now, but uh, definitely, uh, you know, our, student, our students have grandparents largely uh, that they're living with, or parents, uh, obviously, and you don't know who is in a household. You don't know who's visited that household. Uh, so it's making that, that honored pledge uh, when, when you visit and you enter the school that you, and you indicate at least uh, you're, uh, you're being truthful on this, uh, that you are, uh, you have not been outside of Korea, no one in your family has been outside of Korea, and you don't come from any of the designated areas uh, that were associated with uh, the pandemic in the beginning, and now, in our case, might be uh, uh, hanging out in Itawan or wherever it might be within the Association of uh, Seoul. So this pledge is, uh, is on top of the thermometer check that you are given at the start. Uh, if you fail any of those aspects, you're denied entry uh, and alerted. And in the case of a student or a, uh, a staff member, placed into our isolation room for follow-up. Okay, Grace, there might be questions that's come out of that section at least, because that's more, most pertinent to the, uh, to the webinar. Um, I think David Chadwell commented that the social distancing is a big issue and um, that it's very hard to control um, and that uh, especially with students who have been living with the quarantine for a long time. So we briefly went over the procedures that we put into place, um, the, the feet stickers, um, the social distancing um, videos that we put out, the procedures, um, the masks, um, each hall receives two masks. Uh, do we have a question or a comment coming in? I think um, Kevin, Kevin, oh, yes. Hello. This Great. Is uh, Trillium. This is Trillium. I just maybe would like to add that um, from the schools that we're seeing, a, a lot of our schools are, are changing the number of students that they're having in a classroom and um, moving desks around and moving, for example, um, uh, exam sized desks into classrooms that might have had larger collaborative learning spaces um, and in some cases that's required by the regulations of the area that they're in and in other cases it's in an attempt to create that distancing um, and then just really looking at not using some of the spaces that include a lot of high touch areas at in the beginning like um, DT labs and certain science spaces and art art spaces and so forth but rather moving some of those activities into regular classrooms, keeping kids in one classroom for more of the day, um, where some of the teachers are doing the moving to eliminate some of that friction in the hallways and so forth, um, staggering the, 
the pastimes. Um, so those are some of the strategies that we're hearing in other schools. I mean, it sounds to me like your regulations are maybe less stringent than a lot of the other schools that we're working with that have really just a, like even more um, regulations that they're having to adhere to. I don't know if that's what others um, on the webinar are feeling too. I think maybe you got, you're a little lucky in certain regards actually. Yeah, well, we're, we're fully aware that uh, the, uh, the, the, the the day to day practices in here, here in Korea have been have been different from what you might be experiencing in uh, in the States. Uh, the de I'm glad you mentioned it. the desk is certainly an issue. We are we're, you know, changing classrooms around to meet the uh, two meter distance and uh, the class sizes. Uh, you can't change the facilities in terms of the room uh, sizes, but you can certainly do what you can internally in which we have uh, to adjust desks. We used the example of moving back in time a little yeah. bit, didn't we? Uh, so. Right, exactly. And I think uh, one of the questions that a lot of parents and a lot of schools will have around social distance, distancing is especially with the younger kids. The younger kids, uh, you know, you can talk to an older, uh, an older student, hopefully, not always, but hopefully uh, they'll follow the, the outline that you give them. But as you mentioned, Trillium, uh, we've started to take a look at how we set up those classrooms as well. You know, fortunately in our, in our lower school, we often have those carpet areas where lessons take place for morning circle. And some teachers have already started to look at how do I space desks out? So some of the students are sitting at tables and desks and some of the students are sitting on the floor so you can get that social distancing space inside. With our ECD where it's uh, a purposeful play or there's activity centers, instead of having maybe four activity centers with four or five students at them, they're increasing the number of activity centers so students can be spaced out um, and there's fewer students at activity centers and there's more space in between them um, as they work together. Another thing that uh, we're talking about with respect to social distancing and that impact of, of a number of people in the same area or in the same room using the same resources, as you touched on, uh, Troy, you know, not using the, um, the library or a maker space or thinking about how you use the phys ed and the gym and how you use the, um, the drama room is something that we're giving consideration to and how we treat the resources that those students are sharing. But equally important is the resources that students are using, manipulatives in the classroom. Um, our ECD, they took every single thing out of the ECD, disinfected it and cleaned it and put it back. And now as they go through the day and these um, materials or resources or manipulatives are being used, they're gonna set them aside uh, as the day goes on and that, that then at the end of the day, they'll clean and disinfect them so they're ready to go again for the next day. So a lot of key points that you mentioned there, Troy, um, and we're just trying to take it uh, a little bit farther within the classroom as well so uh, students can still experience that. You know, something yeah. as simple as walking down the hall. When you take your grade one class down the hall, you don't, you want to limit that as much as possible, but reminding them how to keep their distance as they walk down uh, the hall. Jason, uh, so Troy, uh, and I'm sure our guests online, so I've been involved with schools in, in China for the last uh, 15 years. And one of the things as a young educator, I like to say young educator, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I saw was that, you know, uh, up into middle school and early high school in our context, uh, it was the classroom teachers that were moving and the students stayed in the classroom, ate lunch in the classroom, uh, did everything and built a culture of a unity of a class throughout their uh, entire educational journey. Their graduation, therefore, is highly focused on that one individual class, and they hold that class uh, with their uh, uh, alumni for the rest of their lives. That's a very similar model to what you see here in Korean state schools, China, I think a lot of Asia. I'm not saying that it's the way to go, but in this case, um, and it was mentioned in our kayak heads group meeting, that that sort of timetabling during a pandemic might be uh, a better timetabling schedule where teachers are doing the moving, and there are less, uh, less students moving around in, in schools. I don't know if any uh, panelists want to comment on that topic. It certainly doesn't bode well for the progressive nature and the freedom movement in schools and the atmosphere that we like or I like, but it certainly does uh, uh, provide a answer to some of the social distancing that would be taking place in a normal international school, uh, if I could use the phrase lightly. But uh, that is a big difference between East and West, I would say, uh, from, my, from my knowledge right now. Uh, Grace? Yep. And so I have uh, the results of the poll, and 78% um, voted. So thank you for your response. Has your school reopened? 7% have reopened, and 87% have not reopened, and 6% was partial. Um, if not reopened, do you have a date of reentry for students? And 37% do have a date. 
and 63% um, do not have a date yet and they are still waiting. Is your school a boarding school? 9% um, of the people who are online right now in our webinar are with a boarding school and 9% are partial. Um, so I assume that you offer both. And then 81% not a boarding school. And what curriculum are you running in your school? 63% um, was international, 41% is American, and 2% was local. Thank you for that. Uh, and we're moving on to a very good question that we received. Felicia from Chinese International School in Manila. And she's wondering what percentage of students and parents are requesting for continuation of distancing learning in the first distance learning in the first semester due to fears of contagion um <clears throat> i don't have the uh percentage uh nor do i have the uh, data on that one specifically maybe uh, someone online does but uh we have the uh i guess benefit or uh strange uh situation here in seoul that we i have received petitions uh, from parents and these are petitions to start and petitions to go against what the government is recommending in terms of the uh, the start dates on a scheduled staggered uh, process. So um, I also trying to put that into context. Uh, you know, we are we're an international foreign school. Uh, I think the provisions that have been put in place here have catered largely to the Korean public schools. Therefore, the logic is not clearly understood. Where in the case, if you look at what Germany has done, they've made uh, a logical agreement to opening schools based on uh, let's say transitional years, because those are the years they want to focus in for importance on education. Uh, they focus in on the early childhood as starting earlier because they saw that as a importance for the economy. So in the case of the Korean model, uh, they have an example uh, for starting grade 12 because of Korean exams, we know that. But in the case of uh, early childhood and some of the younger years, that would be the week after. And that doesn't provide uh, parents with as much logic, but it certainly is there. But for families definitely in grade five or grade eight, uh, on the Korean example, they would be starting June the 1st, which is a long time away. And it also causes some conflict with families with children in split grades. So some would be home and some would be attending school. So there's, there's issues on that one that other countries would be, uh, would be uh, uh, observing as well. And could I just add context to these, to everyone listening, that the Korean school system starts at, in March not in August, as most international schools do. So the Korean schools have not started their academic year yet, while we are obviously approaching the end. Yeah, yeah. which is a, a big factor in our push as a foreign group to, uh, to, to come back and finish the year, but uh, on the uh, understanding that it is safe to do so and the ministry is permitting it to happen. Okay, Grace, is there another question there? Can I just add something quick, Kevin, to that? Sure, sure. Um, I, I would say it, it, there was a comment in the chat, and I agree that um, most parents, most of the schools that have started reopening are saying that their parents are not really com saying that they're fearful of sending their children back. Um, they, they believe, especially when they've been notified about what all of the regulations are and the procedures that are happening at the school. But at the same time, most schools that we are working with are planning to be able to flex back and forth between distance learning and physical learning, face-to-face -face learning, um, knowing that that's probably um, what we have to face over the next few years is a possibility of coming back face-to-face -face and then having to go back online and, and some combination of that over the next few years. So um, even though people are excited to get back, knowing that, and making sure that families know that that may not be permanent over the next year either and just setting those expectations from the beginning that when it's safe to do so we'll be face to face but if it's not safe again in the future we'll go back to our online version of, of our school very true uh in fact the uh the ministry has indicated that uh we would be uh, permitted to return but if one case comes up uh, you are forced to close and uh, that would be back to distance learning. And they've indicated distance learning as the uh, operative uh, for that scenario. So you're absolutely right. Uh, that flexibility, uh, this, uh, I think it was my senior leadership team at the very early uh, onset of this said, uh, and I'm sure all heads have agreed uh, that, you know, online learning now is a part of our emergency uh, crisis response. Uh, you know, we'll be practicing fire drills and lockdown 
uh, earthquake uh, and online learning <coughs> set up and provisions in the future. And it'll be, uh, that is the, the new normal. That's exactly what uh, uh, international schools and schools around the world will have to provide for. That will have a significant budgetary impact to state schools and uh, education in general. And I think, if I can say, it's uh, heightened the level of attention and uh, I think uh, need and uh, uh, deliver, uh, delivery of a good quality educator uh, today. It's actually benefited the, uh, the education community and that teachers matter and they matter significantly uh, both for their approach face-to-face uh, -face, but uh, now as an online educator. It's, it's, uh, it's a different type of education and it's, uh, it's not necessarily easier. It's, it's, quite, it's quite challenging to be effective in the classroom as well as effective online and uh, that uh, everyone is learning to improve upon I think. We have a few more questions that came in. Rob Watson, um, he asked, in terms of elementary school, how have you undertaken meaningful assessment during e-learning? And how will you cater, differentiate for students when school reopens who have had very limited parental adult support with e-learning at home over the past few months? Um, and then he mentioned writing end of year reports as a challenge. Uh, great. Uh, <laughs> there's one of the um, one of the things we want to talk about, Rob, and a lot of other elementary schools are probably in the same situation. <clears throat> E-learning for for young kids uh, often comes down, and young students come down to the support that they get at home, how they're able to access the technology in order to access the teaching and the learning, and then the assessment that they're uh, receiving online as well as um, support from parents in, in helping uh, students and, and children um, you know, attempt the assessments and the tasks that are online. Uh, we've done a couple of things. We've used RAS Kids, uh, Reading A to Z, uh, as to help us to gauge some diagnostic assessments for students and their reading ability, and that helps with uh, some of the, the reading. And we've been using IXL Math to get some diagnostics with math. Our teachers have been giving students, um, more so in the uh, grade four and five where they're one-to-one, -one, but even in the, in the younger students, some tasks that they can work on. And that goes back to when I was talking about the number of assignments versus the quality of the assignment or the task. Uh, teachers have started communicating to parents saying, listen, I understand that your child uh, may not be able to complete all tasks, this is the one that we'd really like them to focus on so we can get a formative ability of or understanding of their ability and respond appropriately to that. The, the challenge then comes when we reopen, what do you do? Uh, you, as you said, Rob, you've had these students um, away from you. Um, some of them have accessed the curriculum and the teaching learning quite well. Others have struggled a little bit in the e-learning world. And auto, your automatic response is, okay, I gotta get them in and assess, 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 because report cards are coming up. I need to make sure that uh, all my numbers are in or my, my data is appropriate and my data is accurate. Um, I would caution against that because as was mentioned earlier, we've been off 11, 11 weeks now and it's almost like students have been away for longer than summer. Uh, we need to take a look at their social well-being and their social emotional state, but we also need to um, acknowledge the fact that Dwight School of Seoul is not the only school in this. So South Korea is not the only country. This is worldwide. We need to understand that this is happening everywhere and that there might be some learning gaps somewhere. So we've decided, as I mentioned earlier, to focus on literacy and numeracy, and that's where some of the assessment tasks have gone out online. No student is penalized for not completing the task. But when you are gathering evidence, it's like any other time of the year, you want to see has the student demonstrated the ability to meet the standards? Have they demonstrated that they know the, the learning that you want them to know. Um, you provide them multiple opportunities for that and then uh, not to get into a whole uh, assessment talk, but you're triangulating that data. You're having conversations with kids, you're gathering um, your observations from the work that they've done and you're looking at the product and you have to base it on what you have. So when students come back, there will be teaching and learning that's focused on assessment pieces, but it will be limited and that will be communicated to our parents. It goes back to making sure that that communication with your, all your stakeholders is open and transparent throughout. So you can share, listen, what we're reporting on here is based on what we were able to um, assess your student, uh, your child with, and what we were able to um, do given the, the fact that we were in the, the situation that we're in. And I believe that most parents um, understand that. Uh, if uh, any indication from our parent feedback, um, our parents will be very appreciative of that. Those who have had to support their children at home, 
um, already loved their teacher, but probably loved their teacher that much more now, um, given the situation. And I think um, from our understanding and our communication, most of our parents have been very understanding of that so far. Yeah, I, I don't think, um, uh, Grace, while you're looking for questions, uh, the, uh, it's not a case of whether it's uh, uh, better uh, or worse. It's a case that it is, uh, it is working and we're getting better at it. Uh, I think all schools will look at online learning now as one of the main uh, pedagogical approaches that they're taking uh, uh, as becoming a better educator online. Uh, assessment is a key driver in that. And we, we've been consulting with Achievement for All in the UK, uh, Sonia Blanford, who I don't know if uh, she's on the uh, webinar now, but the, the approaches to learning across the school, provisions for special needs, children online, uh, this is a chasm of, uh, uh, of uh, a questioning that uh, will come out uh, in research later on. Anyone who's conducting research in online education, the, uh, the definition of online education is something that all schools will have to form. I know that uh, as part of our think tank, we've had to do that. And we've also had to look at what learning means and how that will be different online uh, as opposed to face-to-face. -face. Um, this is not about our personal uh, interests. This is about necessity here. So I think we're very fortunate in uh, Korea, and I hope you are online as well, uh, listening in, that your community understands that this is not a case of the school getting it wrong. This is a case of the school trying its best to meet an outcome that is forced upon it. This is a force majeure situation. Uh, we don't welcome it, but we have to make it the best it can be. And I think that that's why we're all listening in here is to gain uh, helpful tips on uh, being more successful in the approach to back to school. Uh, Grace? Okay. We have a few more questions. Um... And I think they could be um, answered by our last section. Um, so we'll cover our last section. And then if it's not covered, I'll um, just reloop back and um, ask those questions. So we're going to move on to Frank, who is going to be talking about the impact of staggered entry for tech. OK, thank you, Grace. Um, well, actually, Kevin's been stealing my thunder a little bit. <laughs> But, um, of course, from, from my perspective, from a technical perspective, um, this whole experience has been awesome because it is indeed the best uh, professional development that I've ever not organized um, because teachers have been thrown in the deep end and we have supported them as best as possible. But at the same time, it has also highlighted um, the need for teaching digital citizenship and the dreaded term 21st century skills to our students. I mean, we are now in 2020, we are 20 years into the 21st century. These are not new skills anymore. These are life skills and we need to have inside of our curriculum embedded into units of inquiry, units in upper school. We need to teach these skills that students need to um, work online, to collaborate, to communicate, to be creative online, uh, critical thinking, uh, research skills, all of that um, needs to be taught. And this whole period of online learning has only highlighted the, uh, the need for us to, uh, to do that efficiently. Um, so yeah, awesome for me. Um, so, Grace, uh, do you have another question there? Um, so, we're moving on to, I think some of these questions, when I um, look through the content that we're covering, could be answered. Um, so, we're moving on to Julie and Jason with the impact of the staggered entry, and we're, we're going to go through that briefly, and I think some of these questions will be answered. Okay, so over the next couple of uh, minutes here, Julie and I will talk about the impact of staggered entry and then also what we look at with respect to our programming and curriculum when we reopen. And some of the, some of the points we've already discussed, uh, so we'll just kind of gloss over those. But uh, when we talk about uh, staggered entry, you saw the dates that were on one of the slides earlier about potential start dates for different grades. Um, we're in a situation where we can try to petition to the government to see if we can alter that a little bit and we have to and hopefully that their response will be favorable towards us. Because some of the concerns that we had with respect to um, staggered entry is, for example, transition years. Um, in grade five, we have students finishing the primary years program, which is part of the IB, and they're, met, they're getting ready to transition into the MYP and into, and into upper school. Uh, so if we wait till later on for those students to come in, we don't have very many school days left to help them celebrate through their PYP exhibition, which a lot of them have been looking forward to, not just this year, but over the last couple of years. 
as well as um, to uh, help uh, transit, prepare them for the transition into upper school. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, uh, we're looking at the early years. Uh, hopefully we could get them in earlier as well, uh, based on their ability to access the online learning, uh, as well as in our school, we're fortunate that the ECD has its own kind of designated area. And when we do that in, impacted uh, or that staggered entry, uh, one of the things that we talk about with the entry is that um, ECD parents don't actually come onto campus to drop off their students. We have TAs and teachers that will meet, be meeting them at the gate and, um, and uh, bringing the children in that way. Um, as Kevin also mentioned, we were talking about whether all teachers come in or not. We decided we've had all teachers in for the last week in preparation for online learning and are going to maintain having all teachers come in, even if their students are still online learning, they can do their online learning program from school. Uh, so they're here to support other teachers with maintaining some of the social distancing in those common areas previously mentioned, like the halls and in the cafeteria. And again, uh, just to touch briefly, because it's already been asked and, and, and answered, we've been communicating with our parents. Uh, Julie and I have parent link, which are uh, class parents or grade parents. And we've been holding our parent link meetings online with our parents through Google Hangout, getting feedback from parents um, as to their input for the staggered, staggered entry and what they want to see that entry look like when, they're, when their children do return. Um, with upper school, moving to a staggered entry isn't too much of a problem. When we first started planning to close down, um, we did have lots of discussions about how to change the curriculum and whether to rewrite basically the timetable to make it more online friendly. And we, at that point, we decided against that deliberately because we thought that the school might have a staggered entry when we come back. So because we've kept um, the timetable as is, it means whatever grade comes in, we won't have any scheduling issues. The only issues I really see are the teachers will have to switch quite quickly from an online class to a face-to-face -face class and back again. And that's probably going to be a bit of a problem to start with. Um, I see that particularly when I started teaching, moving from a grade 12 class to a grade six class and then to a grade 10 class, that took a very quick change of mindset that it took a while to get used to. And I expect this will be the same thing. But I think it is after the initial stages will actually be quite refreshing for the teachers. I see lots of problems with our upper school students with having to actually throw them out of the class because our students do like to stay behind to chat to the teacher and if the teacher has another class starting immediately it's there's less um, signs to hint to the student that there's this another class thundering into the classroom so the teacher is going to be a little bit more explicit I think to actually indicate they have to be elsewhere and also um, to have things like signs on the classroom door to indicate when that particular teacher is not just sitting on their computer doing some work, but actually is instructing a class to stop any other students or my, me as well occasionally, um, walking into their classroom and disturbing their class. Uh, we also have obviously teachers who are parents as well. And initially we have um, the teaching assistants being the babysitters. So when we have a staggered entry, that's going to complicate things a little more. But in upper school, we've already spoken to the teachers about this and we have a cover schedule set up where we'll initially set up an additional class for all of those students to be in. So they can just be on their headphones and with their microphones and be following their classes in there. I think, uh, Julie, I just uh, thought of something while you were speaking and it's probably on the minds of a lot of uh, listeners is that uh, for those in the education business and uh, now with a lot of knowledge, uh, uh, the, the whole redesign of a future school uh, with online provisions built in is going to look totally different. Um, you know, if you, were, if you were building a school today, uh, what provisions would be in place uh, that would not have been considered uh, months ago? You know, uh, what would you want in school today? That's a whole different webinar altogether, but it's, it's certainly uh, practices that we're placing now would be certainly uh, practices that uh, will, uh, will get better in the future. Um, uh, Grace, what else? Uh, questions from the... Uh, we have a question from Tanya Hall. Are we preparing teachers to do both classroom teaching and e-learning at the same time, allowing students um, and parents to decide to do one or the other and have a choice? Good question. Um, 
Not choice. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, it's uh, for us here, I think maybe some schools might be different. Uh, our capabilities would uh, suggest that if we were running face to face in the school, we wouldn't be running online. Uh, we can certainly do uploads and, uh, and make provisions for catch up, but I don't think that we're capable of doing both at the same time. I think as uh, largest and certainly state schools, maybe uh, provisions uh, for that could be uh, uh, feasible, but uh, it's not a question that hasn't been asked and it is a question that's actually been wanted. Uh, some parents uh, would be also, I think, in favor of having the choice of returning to school or uh, sticking with uh, online learning. I know in the case of a few, uh, they really enjoy the online and they like the, uh, the freedom, uh, quote unquote, of uh, doing it under their own time. Uh, that would be a decision that I guess the school and its administration would have to make, but uh, we wouldn't be able to condone it or uh, uh, follow through with it in terms yeah. of doubling up. Tying in on that, um, I was thinking it's, it is, of course, there is a danger that once we are going to come back into the classroom, uh, the teaching and the pedagogy will revert to old routines. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we will, we will face coming out of this period is to keep the improvements that this period of, of e-learning has given us yeah. um, so that we, for instance, can uh, continue to make these uh, uh, tutorials and to have a flip model, um, which would, to some extent, enable us to to accommodate students that are not yet in school while we're opening. That's that whole getting back to uh, getting back to know the student. You know, some of our students will definitely have been further advanced, and some may be further behind. And it'll be realigning them, uh, bringing them back to center. Uh, whether that's uh, uh, necessary or not, uh, it's going to mean that all schools are going to be adjusting on that uh, flip uh, and the flexibility that's needed in between. Uh, any speakers online or any questions on that topic? That would be of uh, interest to us as well. I think additionally, uh, having conversations with our teachers here, uh, the, the relative speed at which teachers made that, that change from the normal teaching to online or e-learning teaching was quite, quite impressive. Um, and as you, as you went through it, as you went through it, it, it grew and they became stronger and they became better at it. Uh, but it doesn't come without stress. It doesn't come without um, a little bit of anxiety for some, as Kevin was talking earlier about anxiety, that pressure. Um, to be the teacher that they want to be, to, to deliver the program that best fits the kids that they face uh, and they work with on a day-to-day -day basis. That's at the heart of every, every teacher. And so they want to continue to do that in e-learning. Um, to ask them to do that through an e-learning program and to do that face-to-face -face with, uh, with students on a daily basis. Um, we know teachers are, have superpowers, but I don't think their superpowers are that strong. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so the conversation would be, those who stay home because of this, what would you normally do if a student was absent? If a child was absent from your class and they needed to get caught up on the work, what would you normally do? Can you provide them even maybe with a little bit extra because of the situation, but without having to go all that way? So that's some of the conversations that we've been having with teachers. And I think one of the good things about this as well, which all the teachers will take away, is we've mandated that every teacher has to make their own instructional videos. Um, a minimum of two per week for every one of their class. And this has been quite a large learning curve for many of our teachers and they, and I think the majority of our students absolutely love it. The feedback we've had from students is how much better their own teacher speaking to them is than a YouTube video, which might have all the flashy animation, but their teacher stood in front of a whiteboard or using a virtual whiteboard or just the teacher's face there on a video has been a lot more powerful to many of our students than anything else we could have found pre-made on the internet. And I think that's one of the big takeaways that lots of our teachers have said is that they're going to continue making these once we're face-to-face -face in school. Okay, and I think that answered Charlotte Diller's question regarding if we're going to do face-to-face -face distance learning or a hybrid. Um, and we're moving on to Ann Fowles, who's asking if we can share um, the things in the class kit um, and the other requirements that the government has given us. Um, yes. And, and I assume that this is to prepare um, for whatever um, city and country that you are in. 
um, so that you could start preparing for those things. So we would be happy to share those resources. Hi, Anne. Uh, lovely to see you online. Um, you're in Malaysia. Uh, we'd love to know uh, how things are going there. This uh, sanitary, uh, sorry, uh, what do we, what's the actual phrase of it, uh, Frank? The virus supplies kit. The virus supply kit that is mandated to all schools is simply a container that you have to fill with these items. And as I mentioned before, uh, the digital thermometer, uh, uh, also I guess you would have to have spare batteries in there. Uh, now they put in five masks for each classroom. So they, they identified five uh, masks and uh, I think those uh, are sitting there in the center. Uh, there are the wet wipes or sanitary uh, um, um, wipes for cleaning desk spaces or hands or something uh, uh, that are required and the sanitizer that exists as well as gloves. Now on the top middle is a, a glove, so you have to have gloves. So obviously uh, if a child is uh, appearing ill or there's uh, something that uh, uh, needs to be cleaned up, there are provisions there in every classroom. Now. Um, that at uh, expense to the school is put together. Uh, now that is quite inexpensive if you look at uh, what's required for state schools. The thing that is not so inexpensive are the purchase of thermal cameras and uh, provisions for staffing for making sure that the entrance and exits are manned and, uh, and controlled uh, in addition to the technology that is required throughout the entire uh, school. Uh, but Anne, uh, I don't know if uh, uh, things are the same or different in Malaysia. I, I guess you could put in a little note there, but we will certainly share that as we will share the, uh, the information on the, uh, on the kit. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then we have a question. Are your teachers doing online teaching, recording their class teaching, and then providing links to these classes to parents and students? Um, and they are recording lessons, but not providing the links because they want to make sure that their students are attending and having these lessons in real time. I, I think that's what you're asking. And um, you would rather have the students attend um, and curious to see our thoughts and our approach to this and why we made that decision. So we, as uh, Julie explained, for the majority of uh, the classes, um, we have about 50% of the classes being taught uh, live as is. These are not pre-recorded classes. These are live classes, live sessions in Google Meets. Um, and additionally, the other 50% of the time we have drop-in sessions and teachers record, pre-record um, tutorials and mini lessons that are shared with their class and therefore are available before uh, and or after um, a class or a subject being taught so that students, um, specifically ESL students who may be struggling with the pace of uh, online uh, learning, they can, they can go back and re-watch videos as many times as they need to um, and they can also prepare questions ahead of the class coming up. So they, they've got the information before the class comes up and they can prepare their questions and as Julie may have said, in many cases, um, shyer students who might be uh, hesitant to raise their class, their hand in class, um, have been asking very good questions and uh, have been asking many questions and have been really engaged in this process. That that maybe f suits them better. No. No, in, oh, sorry. And uh, just on what you've just said, we've had, we have a few of our students that we've known will be leaving the school at the end of this year due to changing jobs, etc. And some of those parents have come to us now after seeing how much um, some of the children have actually done on an online school and have actually made the choice for the future of not going to a physical school when they move, but moving to an online school because it suits, seemed to suit their children's learning much better. It's interesting. Uh, uh, anyone who's into uh, educational research, this is a, this definitely going to be a big area. Um, we've seen uh, what Julie and Frank are talking about uh, in the context of children with uh, special educational needs. Uh, it's been the opposite of what I first uh, initially uh, thought would be the situation there. We've seen a lot of our uh, students in our Quest program actually advance uh, and, uh, and welcome this opportunity. And you could look into reasons why but also uh, Dwight, uh, Dwight Schools uh, has been running a Dwight Global Digital uh, Online School for several years now. And where we've seen state schools or uh, boarding schools and schools in general around the world uh, 
uh, decrease, uh, our online uh, school has certainly increased. And I think that that uh, bodes for the uh, situation in the world at the moment that more people are becoming, uh, well, I guess, uh, less, less stable uh, physically and more online uh, globally. And that, uh, that uh, bodes well for not only Dwight Online and Dwight Global, but also for all of us who will be using Dwight, uh, sorry, be using uh, online education uh, as, an, as an additional tool in, uh, in our schools. Um, Grace? Okay, um, and then we really quickly have the result, results from the AirPost, um, the webinar COVID-19 um, school reopening uh, poll. And there are 9% um, who's, oh no, that's the same poll. But we have a second poll that we're loading right now. Um, if you could just take um, a few seconds to answer those questions. And in the meantime, we're gonna switch back to Julie and Jason on the impact of the program and curriculum um, as far as reopening. Okay, uh, so again, some of the stuff that, uh, you know, in the interest of answering your questions, we touched on a little bit. Um, just to add that one, one more piece to that last question about recording lessons and having links. For those of you um, who are, are not familiar with Seesaw, Seesaw U is um, almost like a blog kind of uh, platform. And so throughout the whole e-learning process, our teachers have been um, recording their lessons. Think of it like as a mini Sesame Street uh, skit or, or mini lesson about seven minutes. They record it and they post it on Seesaw. So it's there and um, parents can scroll back or students can scroll back, scroll back as far as they want and rewatch the, the lessons over and over again. So those ones are videoed and they are posted and they're, um, but the, the integrity of the access to that is, is based on the student's ability to access Seesaw. So those lessons are there. Um, in that interest, as we open and we take a look at uh, our program again, um, as mentioned, you know, we've had a number of students who have really uh, been um, experienced success through e-learning and it's been a real upscale to their, um, their tech skills. And so our teachers are gonna have to uh, remember that and take a look at that and kind of look at how they balance that return to school. We've had some students who've been so successful with technology and e-learning that when they come back, they want to continue that way, even if they are in the building. And we've others who have struggled. And so you can't uh, necessarily just quit e-learning cold turkey just because people are back in the building. Um, you have to kind of look at the impact that that shift in that transition um, is going to have. And so our teacher is going to work at how they balance with uh, continuing um, their program delivery in class with the use of technology and with the use of that technology. Well, as candidly, uh, Jason, how's it gonna change you as a, as a principal in lower school now? Uh, uh, reflecting on this and the opening of the school with the, uh, the provisions that have been put in place in the past and the idea that you're coming back in and then the flexibility of maybe returning to online in the future, the high flexibility uh, probability story of that, how has that affected you as, a, as, a, as an administrator now? Well, having conversations with their teacher, um, a, lot of the, the, a lot of teacher reflection has been about how they deliver that program. Um, the pacing, whether they use technology or they don't use technology, how as a principal I can support them and, and use the resources available to me in the school to support them with respect to um, their knowledge of techno technology use. Um, how I can have conversations with them about, uh, as you mentioned earlier, um, uh, a week program is highlighted in online learning. Um, good pedagogical practice and understanding the pacing of how you deliver a lesson, how you break down a lesson, how you speak to, uh, with children and, and pace. I know sometimes I speak quickly, uh, so you slow that down um, so you can have the students really comprehend and understand. Um, having them have the skills to be able to go back to the resources if you have created a video lesson, how to prompt students to go back and rewatch that again and, and how you can prompt them to ask questions. So there's a lot of um, aspects of working with teachers in the development of their program that as a principal, I'll be looking to support and as I reflect from that perspective. One of the, one of the things uh, that I, I've uh, appreciated is sitting back with really talented people here and watching it all unfold. Uh, I'm sure that our audience is not uh, 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 unfamiliar with this, but one of the return to school issues was uh, the uh, parent-teacher conferences that we held recently. Someone asked a, comp, uh, a question about assessment, uh, but the uh, teacher conference uh, was the first time we'd done a, an online conference. And 
Uh, what was the outcome of that uh, as a result of it? What, what did you feel in, in terms of administration in the school and the uh, productivity of it? It actually went much better than I thought it would. Mm. The they teachers um, sat in their own classrooms and um, basically set up links, which Frank helped them with instructions for in advance with each of the parents. And the parents logged in on time. They actually, in some cases, we had three different people log in at the same time. We had the child who'd refused to move out of their bedroom. We had one parent who was downstairs in the living room. And we had another parent who was at work or in another country, all logging on at the same time to do the PTS conferences. And I think from, oh, yeah. go ahead. Oh, go ahead. From upper school perspective, it's something that afterwards we've reflected on and we're going to have to discuss on how we can perhaps do this in the future or hybrid face-to-face -face and online model in the future because it was so successful. I think um, that's a very important part, especially when we talk about parent uh, conferences. I don't think the, uh, the link to parents and e-learning stops at just PTS conferences. We've talked a little bit about the support that they've had to give their child. doesn't matter if they're in grade 11 or if they're three years old in preschool. And so as we talk about how we're going to support and upscale teachers, how we're going to um, support and upscale students with respect to technology for the um, probably the probability that we'll be e-learning again, uh, we need to think about how we support parents and how we upscale parents with their technology and their support. Uh, in our school, I know both in upper school and lower school, we hold a number of workshops for parents on a variety of topics. I can pretty certain tell you what the next one is going to be on when yeah. we hold it and we're open, and that'll be e-learning for parents, yeah. how to support your child at home. And I'm so, doing one on Thursday <laughs> with grade go. three parents. And, uh, if I could segue to a conclusion of sorts, uh, I think that uh, even though the topic today is about reopening and, uh, and running the school and the provisions necessary to make that effective, uh, our individual circumstances around the world will be different and they'll be varied and they'll be, uh, uh, they'll be uh, not necessarily uh, in terms of best practices that we're following, but it's going to be, as uh, Trillium said, representative practice that we can learn from each other. Um, I can speak from the point of view of Korea that this has not been an easy uh, situation in the past uh, 9 to 11 weeks. Uh, I find myself having more meetings and uh, more work than I've ever experienced uh, based on the fact that this is new, but it's also the anxieties, the HR issues centered around it. Uh, but I can guarantee that all of us around the world are going to be facing a different professional development budget in schools, which for next academic year is going to be less on conferences that are away because of uh, circumstances and more about things that are happening in school using representative practice and possibly online uh, workshops. Uh, with that, I will conclude by saying uh, it is uh, our natural instinct to be social and uh, to be together. Um, <laughs> I have the blessed uh, uh, benefit of having a really good team around me and we have circumstances here in Korea where everyone is with us. We are doing things socially online, which uh, is making provisions for our new staff coming in that will be quarantined for 14 days. Uh, and that is an, a, a really big step for schools and how they're going to manage the reintroduction of teachers and students in, in August. So we haven't even started about the new academic year and how that's going to pan out. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Trillium this evening, uh, uh, it may be uh, an issue that is, uh, that is raised then, but uh, providing schedules now as schools for, uh, for our relocating staff that is going to be uh, basically them sitting in an apartment for 14 days and how that's going to be uh, motivating them to stay in the country and to, uh, and to develop an appreciation for culture is going to maybe bring a whole different layering to international education and the experience and the, uh, the effect of that. So um, with further ado, I'd like to say thank you to Grace. Uh, and if you want to sum up. Uh, we have um, just one last question and one okay. last comment um, from Ann Fell. She was saying that, um, she said, hello, Kevin, and um, they're <laughs> getting to reopen. Uh, they were getting ready to reopen, but then the government extended their movement control order, which, um, I had to look mm -hmm. that up, but basically it's the same thing with the Korean government. Um, we're in the same boat and we're getting to, uh, we thought we were going to reopen also. I think this is our fourth time as mentioned. And um, we were prepared for staggered entry um, this Wednesday. We even have our welcome back sign up and um, it's been delayed for another week. So uh, we're with you. Um, the last question is, um, let's see, how are schools continuing on with their teacher evaluation? 
That's a good one. Appraisal, a whole different context to appraisal and uh, teacher evaluation now. Um, so um, I think that without going into the, the exact detail of it, I think that it, it, it must continue. It has to have an element where there's uh, an observed uh, uh, ability to see what's going on in the online classroom. And that, that's actually quite easy to do now. But uh, I'll, I'll sort of start, and I think we can end very quickly on this one, is that uh, is there any real difference between the, uh, the lead up to a face-to-face -face, uh, taught class and a face-to-face -face taught online class? I don't think so. Uh, it still needs to be prepared. It still needs to be uh, controlled and it still needs to be assessed in terms of its outcomes. I think that uh, what I'm hearing amongst our teachers is that uh, the initial step into online was something that would be new and exciting and short term. Now that it's longer term, uh, the excitement may not be as high, but the deliverables are certainly uh, now coming through that we made a significant change that uh, the knowledge and the trans transition of learning has to be something that we're going to uh, monitor and also assess and, uh, and, and, and put forward as uh, important. Learning online. Um, it's a very interesting uh, short phrase. Uh, learning does take place, definitely. Uh, marking that learning and identifying it within the scope and sequence of a, of a, of a class uh, unit plan uh, and ensuring that's happening and the mapping of that will be a job for all of us in terms of uh, the management of uh, new online schools and new line, online education. Um, I think that before we go into the assessing of teachers on that, I think we can come up with all kinds. It's going to be made easier by touch buttons and uh, surveys, but uh, to actually observe the sage on the stage through an online classroom or however you want to express it would be uh, a different avenue and a different platform that we'll be using for uh, uh, teacher appraisal definitely in the future. Uh, Grace? Okay, um, and then we have the results of the polls. So um, everyone uh, who was on this that voted, um, they all switched to e-learning and looks like um, people were using multiple platforms as were we. Um, but Google Classroom was the highest ranked one with 73% um, and 71% was Seesaw, um, which is uh, both of those we are using as well. Um, and then Microsoft was 15%, uh, Managed Back was 24%, um, Zero with Adobe Connect, and then other platforms, 17%. Um, Zoom, oh yes, Zoom, um, it was 68% that people are using, so I'm guessing um, that uh, was also used as a platform, although it's not um, really a classroom, is it? Um, and then the platform, um, do you like the platform you are using? 78% said yes, and 17% said somewhat, but it could be better. And 5% said that it's what we have for now, but um, in the future, they're going to figure out a new platform that works better for the school. And the last question, I think there's a few more, but we're just going to move on to this one. Um, basically, it was asking if your school is closed for the rest of the year and um, half uh, reported yes, it is closed for the rest of the year and 32% are still holding out hope. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, hoping that the government will allow schools to reopen again and we are hoping that as well. That's all we have, yeah. Good. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you online. Uh, thank you, uh, Trillium, for joining in and uh, all of the uh, guests for uh, listening in. Uh, I, uh, webinars are certainly new for me and uh, certainly something I was not my vocabulary or my interest in the past, but I can see it being a representative tool for uh, like-minded individuals and certainly uh, quite useful uh, when it gets into the uh, nitty-gritty of things. Uh, I can come up with probably five topics uh, from this one, and I can see that there's a, an interest out there. But uh, if anyone wants to carry on with the communication, you know how to get a hold of us. Frank is going to upload the materials, and there's a yes. short bio at the end. Um, and I think that if you are uh, riveted by what uh, we've said today, uh, it'll be even more riveting this evening with uh, Trillium, who is 10 times the person and far better at uh, putting this together. And I'm uh, looking forward to that this evening. What time is it on, Trillium? Um, it's um, 9 p.m. in sorry, 9 p.m. in Shanghai time, so 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time in the U.S. Because um, our schools span both, well, all over, really, 22 time zones. So we have 2,600 people signed up for the webinar tomorrow morning already. Not to scare you, Kevin. 
Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to make any concluding remarks, Trillium, or is that, are we finished here, I think? No, thank you. Good. Uh, so thank you, Ericos. Thank you, Edward. Uh, thank you, everyone uh, who's been involved. And uh, uh, I wish you well. I wish you health. And uh, please, uh, I wish you a safe travel home and back without quarantine in the summer. Uh, that is uh, my biggest wish. I wish to get home and get back without quarantine. And I wish life would continue and uh, go on as normal. But there is no normal. This is the new normal. And that's a cliche end to a very uh, interesting webinar. So thank you, everyone. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Thank you.